My name is John Crock. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Center for Research on Vermont uh, here at the University of Vermont. And together with Tom Helmstutler and our office coordinator and Cheryl Morse, our director, I'd like to welcome you here to this evening's presentation, Diversity and Decentralized, Green Mountain Power's View of the Future by GMP CEO and President Mary Powell. The seminar is the third presentation uh, in the center's Vermont Energy Future Series, with numerous challenges and changes in our state's energy portfolio, including the uncertain future of Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, changes in utility ownership, the advent of new renewable energy sources, and the development of technologies to improve efficient use of electricity. The center decided to offer multiple opportunities to discuss the various elements of our state's energy future. Uh, the series has proven to be incredibly timely, particularly tonight's presentation and last week's as well. Each Wednesday for five weeks, we're hosting a discussion of an energy-related topic. We're pleased that leaders such as UVM Interim President John Bramley, Vermont Attorney General William Sorrell, Elizabeth Miller, Commissioner of the Department of Public Service, and Representative Tony Klein have joined us for these discussions. Two weeks ago, we hosted a nationally recognized commentator James Howard Kunstler for his presentation entitled The End of Cheap Energy. The event drew 800 audience members, evidence of the fact that energy is on Vermonters' minds. Next week, April 4th, energy entrepreneurs David Blitterzdorf of All, energy, All Earth Renewables and Beth Sachs, co-founder of the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, will lead a presentation titled Clean Energy Equals Jobs. That seminar will take place at 7.30 in the John Dewey Lounge on the second floor of the old mill building here at UVM, a couple of doors down. We hope you can join us for that as well. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the, the Gund Center for Ecological Economics, the Clean Energy Fund, and the Environmental Program for their support of this series. RETN is our media partner. They film our programs, air them on channel cable channel 16 and make them available to watch digitally on their website, retn.org. Thanks to our film crew this evening for filming tonight's presentation. Last week in another incredibly timely presentation, center member Dr. Richard Watts drew a large and enthusiastic crowd to a discussion of his new book, Public Meltdown, the story of the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. We are grateful to Richard not only for his invitation to work with the Center for Research on Vermont in this publication, but also for his tireless efforts in putting together this energy series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Watts, who will introduce tonight's speaker. So thank you all for, and I know there's a few people here who've been to our first two and plan to go to all five. Yes, so at the very end, it would be really interesting to hear from some of you any threads that run through this seminar series. Tonight, it's my honor and pleasure to get to introduce Mary Powell, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of Green Mountain Power. So Green Mountain Power currently has about 92,000 customers. It's uh, entity and a utility that's been part of Vermont's fabric for over a hundred years. One of the original utilities that knitted together many of the small towns and communities that make up Vermont's electric energy infrastructure. And Green Mountain Power is presently in discussion in talks merging with Central Vermont Public Service. If approved by the Public Service Board, it would be an electric utility that would serve about 250,000 Vermont customers, 75 or 80 percent probably of the entire electricity portfolio of Vermont would be delivered through this combined company of which Mary Powell may be the president of. So Mary is somebody who thinks about electricity in Vermont all the time. She thinks about it from an electric utility perspective. It's great to have her part of the series that will conclude with the state's perspective. We'll have a legislator, legislative leader and the commissioner of the Department of Public Service. 
but Mary has been a part of Green Mountain Power since I think about 1998, as one of only five women chief executive officers of a investor-owned utility in the country, has been a real presence in Vermont on thinking about energy issues and thinking about Vermont's energy future. So it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce Barry Powell to help us think about this as part of this seminar series. Thank you for coming. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. Um, I love the opportunity to talk about energy in Vermont. Um, it is a topic that does tend to draw a crowd, it seems like, wherever you talk about it, wherever you go. That certainly seems to be true nationally as well now, I would say, as well as in many situations internationally. And I think uh, that's a great thing. Um, I'm really thrilled that so many people care deeply about energy, about where they get it, about the impacts of energy, and about the impacts of their own personal choices. So it's, it's really tremendous to be a part of this series. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, just a little bit um, about my background because I always find it helpful to understand a little bit when I hear people about kind of who they are personally. And so just quickly who I am personally, I still, I sit there and when Richard describes, you know, CEO, utility company, merging another utility company, one of five of utility company, <laughs> honestly, I still have this feeling of like, oh my God, is he really talking about me? <laughs> and um, not because I'm impressed at all with the position I have, but more that I am shocked that I still, after all these years, that I would be working in this sector. Um, when I was approached to work at Green Mountain Power, 12, 13 years ago, I actually turned the job down three times because I had such a bad attitude about utilities. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't picture myself like my name and a utility. I kind of thought, how am I going to tell my friends that I work for a utility? Um, so in many ways, I've coined myself the accidental executive. I grew up a uh, liberal arts focus and an arts focus. I was an artist in high school. I uh, tried some arts in college, realized I was never going to be able to feed myself with my artistic talent, um, and basically fell into the world of uh, business and then have continued to keep falling back into it. Um, so I came to the utility uh, space with, um, you know, kind of a negative attitude about utilities um, and have found that, uh, that, that uh, it was yet an, another example in my life of I didn't know what I didn't know uh, because this has been one of the most profound uh, personal and professional experiences of my life. Um, it's opened up my eyes uh, to so many things. It's made me question so many assumptions about things I believed and thought I knew. Um, and it's helped me to really grow uh, tremendously. And I also have had the great opportunity to bring my uh, contrarian nature right into the inside of the utility sector, which I have really enjoyed. And I've had the, the uh, wonderful opportunity to lead, I would say, a series of uh, what has felt like revolutions uh, within the utility space. So I just want to give you a little bit of a background now on the company. Um, and for me, it really is, all of our work really is about moving towards a clean, green, cost-effective future uh, for customers and for Vermonters. And so I still feel like my orientation after all these years is really uh, principally as a Vermonter and one that shares the values, I think, of most Vermonters, which is I care deeply about the state I love, I care deeply about the environment, um, and I care deeply about uh, are being able to uh, be a, a, a prosperous place for people from a socioeconomic perspective. So I care deeply about social values, about environmental values, uh, and that has informed uh, my thinking on everything that I do at Green Mountain Power. Um, you know, as, as Richard said, we're soon to serve 70% uh, actually of, the, of Vermonters if our transaction is approved uh, by the Public Service Board. Uh, candidly, I, I believe it will because it's been something, some of you may not know this, 
because you're a lot younger than I am, but it is something that literally has been talked about in the state of Vermont for 40 years. 40 years. In fact, the day that CVPS accepted our offer, one of our line workers in the company came up and put on my desk an article from a, news a newspaper article from literally 40 years earlier that talked about the great innovation and the great benefit for the state of Vermont if the two large utilities would uh, combine. So um, to me, it's, it's common sense because it's all about getting to a clean, green, cost-effective future. So hopefully that'll, that'll happen. Right now, we, we do have the lowest overall rates uh, of New England investor-owned utilities. Uh, in fact, Green Mountain Power customers enjoy the lowest overall rates of any utility in the state of Vermont as well, municipal, cooperative, investor-owned. <laughs> we are at the overall lowest uh, rate uh, in Vermont. So I think a lot of that is we have an obsession on you know, that clean, green, cost-effective future. Um, the, the company did go through a dramatic reinvention. Uh, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, part of why I said no when I came to the company uh, was, you'll see a picture in a couple slides, but it was this Big, it was called the Glass Palace where the company worked. It was this big, intimidating campus, basically, off of Shelburne Road. And you had to go up these big stone stairs to get to the CEO who I was interviewing with, who was a wonderful man. He's, he was a key part of our reinvention as a company. Uh, he led it. He was the CEO at the time. He asked me to lead the actual work, but he was the CEO. But at that time, you walked up these stone stairs. You had to get through two private secretaries you got to this massive private office with a private bathroom, private conference room, and it was just, it all spoke of bureaucracy, power, and intimidation. And that was a big part of uh, why I didn't see that it would be a fit uh, for uh, my personality and for the types of companies I've really enjoyed working in. Well, I was fortunate enough to actually get to be uh, the leader of a revolution of the company where uh, it was all about moving to a much more contemporary, fast, energetic, and effective organization. So this is a picture tells a thousand words. That's the old GMP uh, right in that corner in the glass was uh, where the CEO was on the top floor uh, with, of course, incredible views of the lake and the mountains and all the rest of that that comes with all of the pomp. Um, this is the new Green Mountain Power. Uh, we took an old service center of ours uh, right over there that actually, uh, I always like to say, people say, oh, are you at Water Tower Hill? And I always like to say, no, we're in the shadows of Water Tower Hill right next to the dump, uh, which is actually where I think a utility probably should be uh, because it's a very low cost place to be and to operate out of. Uh, but what we did is we moved it to uh, what I call a colorful Costco. Uh, it's a completely open office environment. Um, I, I stand, I have a stand-up desk in one of the heaviest traffic areas of the company. Uh, any employee walking by can see what's on my computer any time of day and can approach me any time of day. And uh, my square footage is about the size of those three or four chairs put together and it's the same throughout the entire company. It's a part of you know, instituting a culture that is around being flat, fast moving, and customer focused. And the color brought, the other thing I found that was fascinating, and maybe that was just the art training <laughs> from when I was young, but I'm a big believer in colors impact a lot, how we think about things and how our energy levels operate. And pretty much any utility I had been in was brown or gray. That was pretty much the decor, brown or gray. And uh, we really introduced a lot of color and one of the interesting things that folks say when they come to our offices is and I love this being an electric utility they always say I can feel the energy and that's and that's true you can you can feel the energy of the people that work there um, so the facts then where we were traditional um, you know now I think we're, we're recognized we have been uh, publicly recognized for our corporate culture uh, our space our uh, dramatic reshaping of the organization. Um, you know, we uh, change starts at the top. I always believe that. Um, somebody told me when I came to Vermont that there was an old Vermont saying, I'm not so sure because I think I'm the one who's repeated it the most, but she said the fish sinks at the head 
and that when there's a problem in the organization, most people like to look down, like it's somebody out there, it's the tellers, it's the waitress, it's, you know, but the problem is usually always at the top. And so where we started was really flattening at the top of the organization. So we reduced a lot, not just of officers, but of managers, eliminated numbers of layers in the organization so that we could get to a faster, more effective organization in terms of how we interact and how we make decisions for customers. So those are some of the facts. Um, and the whole deal, right, is about doing all of that, but not just doing it so that we all enjoy going to work more, which we do, um, but that we actually are doing better things for our customers. And in fact, you know, all the data would show that that's what we've done. The data point here that always just blows me away, because I'm the one who said no to joining the electric sector <laughs> so many years ago, is the 90% customer satisfaction. And it's not us. We're not the ones collecting that data. It's an outside firm, and it's, uh, and it's overviewed by the regulators. So it's, it's uh, nothing that we can be fabricating on our own. And it just knocked me over with a feather. Year after year, we're usually somewhere always around 90%, um, which to me is, is uh, just amazing. Because I would think, you know, ind industry average is about where we were back in 1998, still now. It's in the mid-60s. Uh, so that is, is probably the point that we at the company are the most uh, proud of. Um, so after we did that reinvention, that was nice because we changed the cost structure uh, and made ourselves more lean and effective for customers. We stripped a lot of, we've probably saved our customers about $80 million since we did that change in terms of the operations and maintenance costs of the organization. But that wasn't enough, right? It was really how do you take that and how do you have that inform where you're going from a portfolio perspective? And um, that was one thing I found in the time that I led the change and I was transitioning to CEO of the company, which was in 2008. I found that the one area we had done all of this kind of triple bottom line changing in terms of our operations, we were the first to go biodiesel in the state, we were the first to introduce significant hybrid vehicles, so we, were do we, we reduced paper, we were doing all this stuff, but it really dawned on me, we weren't doing it in terms of the portfolio. We weren't thinking about that in terms of of what our vision was for the future for our customers in terms of what we were buying. We were doing renewable projects because that's what utilities do. You know, all utilities do them. I mean, I will tell you, 90% of them do them so that they can check the box. Like, did that, see, I do it, you know. But it wasn't really necessarily informing how they were developing their strategies and how they were thinking about their portfolio. So we launched a vision at the time uh, that was seen as, I will tell you, quite aggressive because I remember right after I launched it, you know, you always know it's a good vision if you question yourself within like 48 hours after talking about it. And that's what I did because really they're just, I would say principally through the media, you know, there were a lot of skeptics on on our ability to deliver, but it was really about uh, embracing large-scale hydro, uh, and in fact, working really hard, which we did, to have that seen as a renewable resource, so it could become what I called at the time the backup green battery to more uh, renewable energy development in the state, uh, ramping down our dependence on nuclear. Uh, which um, we had at that time, you'll see a portfolio pie in a bit, but we had a great dependence on nuclear and uh, we were the first to get, at, and actually still the only, I don't think any utility followed us, but to say purposefully that we wanted, that we recognized the low carbon attributes of nuclear, but we wanted to ramp down our dependence over a period while we ramped up a cost-effective renewable energy strategy that would mean also more in-state generation. So this is the pie. So this is the pie right before we launched it. And you can see that, you know, and that was another, another piece of it was also to get to diversity, that that would lead us towards diversities. So you can see, even though I said we wanted to embrace large-scale hydro as renewable, you can see what we did in our negotiation. We still ramped down our dependence on these very large sources. So we went from about a 48% to now we're at about a 29% 
Our nuclear dependence in 2007 was, as you can see, 38 percent. We're now at 24 percent, and we're ramping down from there over time. The big thing that, that uh, we're the proudest of, because it was the biggest thing that I had that um, questioning of myself right after making the announcement, was really on the uh, premium renewables. Uh, because a lot of folks were saying, you can't, oh, come on, how can you do that? Do you really think that you can get a wind farm built in Vermont, et cetera, et cetera? Found out it's, it's not easy um, at all, uh, but we are doing it, that is for sure. So in 2016, we will have really fundamentally shifted the portfolio of the company, and that's just the beginning, because then we're really moving into what is our phase two of the, of the process. And so phase two uh, that we just have started launching over the last, I would say, six months to a year was, was informed a lot by, I was chatting with one of our um, GMP Solar customers uh, when I was getting my coffee. And really that program was a big part of what is now informing this strategy. We were the first uh, utility in the state uh, to go out with, we offered a special rate for customers who wanted to have solar on their homes or in their fields and generate uh, uh, solar for their own consumption. We incentivized that behavior. Um, so really what that experience told us is that customers want a deeper connection and that this also gives us a deeper connection with them. They want a deeper connection with energy and we want a deeper connection with you. That's really what the deal is about. Um, and we really see that microgeneration is going to be a huge part of the future. I believe we've hit a tipping point. And I, I, I've seen it both in behavior around vehicles as well as behavior around on-site renewable generation. I think we're going to see a lot more of it in communities and we're going to see a lot more of it in all of our homes. And so we really want to facilitate that and ramp that up over the next 10 to 20 years as we ramp down some of these large sources that we are currently dependent on. Another way we're doing it is we've launched as part of our, our merger, uh, part of the vision wasn't just about combining these companies to lower cost and save customers a couple hundred million dollars. It was also about the opportunity to take what we've done in the solar space and really bring it to uh, Rutland, Vermont in particular, and try to create what I think will be a game changer for Rutland and for Vermont by creating uh, Vermont's first solar city. Uh, candidly, I think it's gonna end up being the region's first solar city. Um, I think we're gonna easily achieve being the most solar per capita of any city in the Northeast. Um, and that, I think, will bode really well, not just for renewable, not just for Vermont, um, but also for Vermont in the context of our economic development. I think that'll bring a lot of opportunity. Um, this is a bit of a redundant slide, I realized, after I put it together. I think it's just restating what I've already said, which was what phase one was, was how do we leverage centralized a uh, power plant approach and phase two is the next logical step. I would also say on this, um, the other important thing is we also saw the tipping point converging really well with smart grid technology and with the fact that we're going to be the first state in the nation to really have a statewide smart grid infrastructure. And that is really, really important as we learn more about how renewables operate on the grid and really allows us to also move to a deeper connection with our customers around energy. And for customers who are interested, if they want to have an electric vehicle in the garage, they want to have uh, smarter appliances over time, they want to have control mechanisms to leverage all of those things along with solar on their roof, there's really cool technology that can be loaded on top of the smart grid technology, but the smart grid technology is the really important infrastructure step uh, that is needed to get to those advancements in a meaningful way for Vermonters. So that convergence, I think, is, is uh, really, really exciting. Um, 
I, I would think, just well, at least knowing some of the folks in the crowd, I'm probably preaching to the choir on this one, I think, with many people, but uh, benefits of local, renewable, uh, you know, we've already seen just in the work we're doing, uh, just for example, our Kingdom Community Wind Project, which I know is not without opposition, uh, but I will tell you that, um, you know, we know for a fact that 78% of Vermonters support it and 80% of the residents of Lowell support the project. And a huge part of it is, I mean, I think a lot of people love renewables. A lot of people also appreciate the fact that it has already contributed 200 jobs uh, to the Vermont economy in building it. The same thing we've seen, I have a friend here in the solar business, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's jobs. There's a lot of jobs that are coming as part of uh, the efforts around solar. So it supports local jobs, it creates economic development opportunity. Another great example of this, and I, it's great to say it at UVM because UVM's been a part of it, I've been part of the effort to bring Sandia National Labs to Vermont. And I will tell you that our solar city and our efforts around renewables are a key part of what's making us attractive to the Department of Energy and to Sandia National Labs. So again, it's that flywheel thing. I don't, I don't know if folks here are familiar with the flywheel concept, but the idea is once you get it turning, it builds a momentum of its own that creates all kinds of opportunity that you and I here today could never even envision because we're just not smart enough to envision all the opportunity that comes once you get the flywheel going. The Solar City, again, is a great example of that. I've had GE reach out, we've had IBM, we've had Department of Energy. We have a lot of partners that are reaching out and want to be part of that effort in Rutland. So again, I think it really does support uh, economic development opportunities and prosperity for Vermont. Um, how we're going to do it is, is through a lot of partnerships. You know, this is not, this is not about, you know, we may be, we may end up being the, the, the largest player in Vermont. The cool thing is we're still going to be Vermont sized because at 250,000 customers, guess what? We're still the second smallest investor owned electric utility in the United States of America. And that's great. That's perfect because that means we're the perfect size for Vermont. We're flexible, we're small, even combined, we're gonna have roughly, after all the attrition happens and retirements, you know, somewhere around five, 600 employees. You know, we're gonna be a small, uh, you know, company that is easy to work with and does tremendous things. The other key here is it's about partnering. It's not about us bringing all the solutions and building things ourselves. That's the old fashioned way. Will we be doing some of that? Absolutely. When needed, when it seems like it's the right shoes for us to step into, but a lot of it is going to be with partners and innovating with partners such as Sun Common, such as uh, you're gonna hear from Beth, who was the founder of Efficiency Vermont. We've started partnering with them. That's gonna be a big way that we're gonna achieve uh, what we see as the, the goals. Uh, this is just a beautiful picture. <laughs> Gives you an idea of, of uh, one of our many uh, solar projects. That was another fun thing. You know, we launched this initiative to have 10,000 panels online in a thousand days. Same thing. People were like, oh my God, how are we ever going to do that? Did it, you know, we blew by that goal. We were there within, I think it was 500 and some odd days we got uh, to 10,000 panels and we've just uh, kept going because the flywheel's turning and people are moving in this direction. Um, solar has a tremendous amount of public benefits. Um, a lot of times I get questions about this, particularly I would say from uh, maybe longtime utility folks. I mean, but you know, for me, the math was really simple to get to. Solar, one of the most important things that you need to know about solar is that it works when we need it most. There's a complete 100% correlation between when solar is working and when Vermont needs it from a, from a system perspective. And that is because Vermont hits its peak, peak energy demand when we're out buying the dirtiest, costliest power for our customers. Because you can never plan peak, right? Unless anybody can tell me they know exactly when it's gonna be 95 hot and sunny. 
I can't plan for it, right? So you hit, you go all the way up, you know, twice your normal megawatt load, and you're out buying the dirtiest, most expensive power. That's always when you can count on solar. That's always when you can count on. And it's never, it never the peak never happens when it's not sunny. So it's, it's, it's perfect coincidence, and it's, uh, it's really, there's many other benefits of it, uh, but I would say from just a you know, pure system perspective, that's probably the most significant one. We also really believe that our work in Rutland might prove out uh, solar as something in the utility world that we call a non-transmission alternative. So instead of building lots more transmission lines to make sure that we can deliver power reliably when it's hot and sunny, you know, is it possible that we could actually use strategically placed solar to help with that and to defray some of those other costs? One of the many things that we're going to study. Um, other partnerships we're doing, um, again, you, you know, I mentioned we're building the large wind. Uh, we also are doing a lot of work about working with communities and uh, Northern Power, which is in Barrie, Vermont, a uh, great company. Uh, builds community scale wind turbines. So we've been partnering with them. We're also investing in our own hydro. Uh, you know, the company is well over 100 years old, and a lot of people don't know it was founded on renewable energy, hydro plants. That was how Vermonters first got uh, their energy. So there's a bit of this uh, clean, green, cost effective future that's back to the future. <laughs> Um, we've, we've done it before. So we're investing in those and making sure that they're working well. We're doing upgrades um, and improving efficiency. So anybody can have a copy of these afterwards, but I certainly don't want to read them all to you. Uh, we also are doing, we've been a leader in the state on uh, getting 7,000 lights in 700 days through this uh, uh, program to uh, change out uh, street lights. So we have a tremendous number of partners. Um, it, you know, there's labor involved, which is great because it creates, helps facilitate uh, meaningful jobs that make us more efficient. This is just more on that program. So really, you know, from my perspective, it's a really simple business model. It's customers, customers, customers. If you focus on the customer, uh, which is really what informed our clean, green, cost-effective future. It actually, that vision actually started, candidly, kind of as a joke. I remember I was at, a, at one of our board meetings and we were talking about the future and talking about Hydro-Quebec and talking about Vermont Yankee and, um, you know, and I said, well, we have to think about what customers want. And the board was like, well, what, how would you perfectly articulate what they want? I said, well, it's, it's easy, actually. I said, they want it clean, green, and free. <laughs> so, so the free part, we haven't yet been able to figure out. But uh, clean, green, and cost-effective has become uh, the mantra of the organization and what we really focus on and what I'm really excited about as I think about Vermont's energy future and about our role. Uh, we want to be facilitators of achieving this future that, that I think gives us as a state, I love this state, I've been part, of, Vermont's been part of me and I've been part of Vermont my whole life. Uh, I've lived here full time for 23 years and uh, I just think we have such a tremendous opportunity in front of us to be an example for the nation, a good example for the nation. I think we already are. And I think if our small size, if we all work together, we can just blow the doors off of what we've done so far um, and we have a really exciting future. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to things that are on the minds of folks in the room. Um, I think your vision for the energy future of Vermont is a very expensive vision. And I think it's also a very self-serving vision because the higher the costs go, the higher the profits go. And I would like to point out that Vermont does not have any need for green energy at all. Because the carbon footprint of Vermont this year and all years is zero. Mm -hmm. Vermont has large amounts of forest. We have about 10 acres of forest per person. Those forests absorb all of the carbon footprint that each of us produces. We need these gimmicks for green energy the same way that fish eat bicycles. 
they're just not necessary. The forests are already taken care of our carbon footprint. And in consideration of this, I'd like you to make a comparison between the cost per kilowatt hour in your vision of the energy future for Vermont, projected cost 10 or 20 years from now, mm -hmm. as compared to just buying the cheapest energy and let the forest do what they do best. Okay, so I don't know if everybody heard your question, so I'll try to summarize okay. and you tell me if I'm wrong. In essence, you don't buy anything I said. You feel that we're on a path to make things really expensive, that we don't have a carbon problem because the forest will take care of the carbon, and you feel that we make all of our profits off of cost, so that's why we're trying to get the cost higher because then we'll make more profits. Um, and I think the other par part was that we have zero carbon in our portfolio now. Does that, is that the essence of it, or is, did I miss that something? That's the background. The question is, I'd like to see the, the cost, cost comparison. Cost. Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, um, just in terms of how a, a regulated utility actually makes their money, it's actually not off of uh, rates and how. So just to, just to make sure we have the background facts correct. Uh, the way it works is really a simple model in that when I have to attract the equity side of the capital I need for a project, say it's a $50 million project, $25 million of that, I have to, the customers have to pay for a return that goes to the investor from which I got that, uh, that money. We don't make, through our alternative regulation, we're not driven by what you actually pay in cost. So we have no incentive for you to pay more. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the, other, the other part is, part of what informed our strategy is actually the misunderstanding that a lot of people have in Vermont that the cheapest form of energy in the Green Mountain Power Portfolio right now actually is not Vermont Yankee Nuclear Plant. Um, it is the hydro plants that I showed you that in the wisdom of those who came before me uh, built on behalf of Vermonters. Uh, because once those plants are paid off, you know, so the simple math of how the utility model works, once I get that equity investment, once we pay that off, you know, uh, just like when you buy a house, then you're paying the operations and the maintenance, you're not paying anything else on the house. It's the same thing with utilities. So customers are only paying the operations and maintenance costs of those plants. The same is true of our wind project. So not only is our wind project, even in the time that we're paying off the debt and the equity cheaper than any wind energy I could buy, bar none, once the payoff period is over, it becomes one of the cheapest forms of energy in our portfolio. So there is real value from a portfolio cost perspective in having Vermont-owned, Vermont generation, particularly in the utility space. Um, so as we look to the future, this is about managing the overall cost. When I purchase for you what might be the cheapest, when you say just go get the cheapest, well, the market changes all the time. I've seen the prices at six cents, I've seen the prices at three, I've seen the prices at probably close to 12, just in the short time I've been in the business. So you need, it's a business where you need to be thinking strategically about how to go to the future. And so we absolutely believe that our portfolio strategy will prove out what is true today. The reason we have the lowest overall costs are in large part because of our wise decisions around our portfolio. That's why we have some of the best rates um, in New England. And that's part of our passion is about how can we secure that position. So I think we agree on, on, the, on, on the goals. And I think that you know, my view is what we're doing is a path to get us there. Um, I would also dispute it is not a carbon-free portfolio now in Vermont. Uh, there is carbon in the electricity uh, portfolio. Uh, not a lot, you're, you're right about that, not a lot, but there is some. But this for me is mostly about having more, uh, Vermonters have more responsibility and more ownership of their energy future. So next question, yes. So uh, natural gas prices right now are really low, and a lot of people are projecting them to stay low for a while. How is that changing the way that you're able to evaluate renewable projects um, over the next sort of 10-year period? Great question, Paul. So did everybody heard that natural gas is low? 
Um, again, uh, you're right, it is. And we're monitoring how that's affecting uh, utilities around us, and I would say it's affecting them slowly. One of the things that we're really pleased about in the uh, agreement that we signed with Hydro-Quebec is that there is a market adjustment. So actually the price of that is coming right on down because natural gas is one of the leading indicators uh, that drives down the price of that. So that's one really big source of renewable energy that again, we negotiated it with the idea of how do we make it our, our cost effective backup green battery while we ramp up some things that could be, you know, the hard thing with this business is you've got to, to always take the long view. You've got to take the long view. And it's tempting because regulators, politicians, customers always want to look at things in a snapshot in time. And that's challenging because you have to look at the snapshot, but you've got to always be thinking long term and strategic. So right now, actually, because back to our portfolio, we have more of an opening than we've had in the past because we diversify uh, by reducing our dependence on the large sources. We actually are taking advantage of some of those low gas prices and it's dragging down the, the hydro Quebec. I think that because of the small slice that renewables still are relative to the whole pie, I think we can continue to go about it in a judicious way. It does say that we should be smart. It says, you know, we shouldn't, uh, you know, we got to be sure that we're doing this in a visionary way that's over many years, which was always part of our original plan. We said it's going to take 20 plus years to get there. Uh, because if you, technologies change, price of solar is coming down, wind prices are actually coming down too. So, and natural gas prices will change. I don't know when, but one thing I can guarantee you is they'll change. <laughs> Next, yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I spent some time in Montana, and when you get to 70% ownership of electricity by one company, even though it's small, it gets to a point where you start to wonder, are they, particularly when the owner is not on site, um, what, what happens, uh, how do you keep from being paternalistic or maternalistic in terms of the state? Can, can, you, can you explain the, what pops in the news every night about the AARP concern that mm -hmm. uh, C, CBP is not uh, is not just giving the people back their money, but is suggesting another way to yeah. repay. I, I can't follow that. It's a sincere yeah. question. It but is. I, but I don't I like you. the potential paternalism that's implied. I get you. So for people who didn't hear, it was really a two-pronged question. First part was, um, how do I grapple with what a large size will be? A lot of relative, power. Lot, yeah, lot exactly, of relative to Vermont. and. And then the other was more specifically, how would I respond to the ads that AARP is running about CVPS and about what should happen with that money? Um, so your first question is, is it's a good one. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one that I personally spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, first of all, this company is run and controlled by, uh, it's a Vermont corporation. Uh, yes, we have our investor is in, in Quebec, in Montreal. Uh, they've been in Vermont for 26 years. Um, part of what attracted us to them six years ago was they had been in Vermont by that point 20 years, and I had never heard of them. Um, because, and I knew people who were on the boards of organizations that they invested in, and it's because uh, those people never mentioned them, and it's because uh, it's a model of uh, they invest in quality companies and it's hands-off governance model. Uh, it's actually less hands-on than when we were publicly held. Because even when you're publicly held, like CV was or is right now, you have investors <laughs> that you're accountable to. And in many ways, that can create, I think, more distorted behavior than, the, than uh, the ability for a team to just be focused on customers and to have that hands-off governance. So that's what we have. That's why it works. And I think that's why it's going to continue to work for Vermont because that's what they've done for 26 years. So, and they're a heavily regulated utility themselves. So they get that model. And that's the other piece I would say is we are heavily regulated. We have, you know, I've worked in unregulated businesses my whole career up until this principally. And, uh, you know, I would say, you know, for those of you who haven't experienced it, it's a very different world. I mean, it is, 
It is, we want to talk transparency. I'd love your average business owner to have to meet the level of transparency that we have to meet on a quarterly basis. Um, so everything we do is reviewed and vetted through that process. So, um, so that's a very humbling process, <laughs> candidly. So I'm hoping that that helps us make sure that we really uh, proceed with humility, which is what it really is about in my mind. Um, you know, because we are, we should be, we are still the second smallest in the country, as I said. And so uh, that is how we view ourselves. We're a company of Vermonters uh, that are deeply committed to the communities they serve. So, um, you know, it's up to us to keep that culture and to not let ourselves become maternalistic or paternalistic in what we do. Um, and, you know, you all will be a measure of how well we do in that you know, over time. The second piece on the ARP, uh, yeah, there was a uh, way back in 2000-ish time period, 1999-2000, there was a rate order uh, that disallowed a lot of the costs the utilities were paying to Hydro-Quebec for power that was being delivered to Vermonters' homes. Um, after a couple of years, they said, well, you can start charging Vermonters for that power that's being delivered to their homes. So it was always being delivered to their homes. The utilities were always paying for it. There was a period of time when it was disallowed. When they said that we could, we could have that back in rates and when people were viewing Hydro-Quebec somewhat differently than they were a couple of years earlier, um, they said, well, but if, if either entity gets acquired, we want there to be some kind of a a payback to customers for that part of the contract that was above market. Um, it kind of goes back to your question about how you do things. It was, it was a long view decision on Hydro-Quebec that fell out of market favor for a few years and it created a disallowance challenge. Um, so, so in that, you know, we had the same thing at Green Mountain and when we uh, affiliated ourselves with Gas Metro, which was much better for customers, we saved them a couple million bucks because we didn't have to go through all the insanity of being publicly held anymore, and we had one trusted investor versus a lot of them uh, and a lot of Wall Street stuff, so um, it was good for customers. What well, we agreed, because actually like a lot of our customers weren't even the same ones that we had when that happened, we agreed that it made much more sense to strategically invest that money on behalf of customers and create savings for our customer base in total versus try to figure out who was a customer at that point seven years earlier and how to divvy it out and so on. And, and actually our program has provided net benefits measured again by the Efficiency Vermont. They're the oversight of it. They do all the measuring of benefits as well as the regulators, as well as IBM and some other large customers. And everybody attests to the fact that we actually delivered about $16 million of value. Our number was $8 million back then. So we doubled what the benefit to customers were through strategically investing in things that would save money. All we're proposing as part of the Central Vermont public service approach is the same it's the same approach. And actually, in our deal a few years ago, AARP actually signed off on it. We, they, they, they signed off on it. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to their motives or what. I know that they're taking on utility issues na nationally. It's a national campaign. Um, you know, they have a particular focus of how they'd like to see it. They've made that clear. Um, we and the Department of Public Service recently agreed they made some tweaks, but they'd rather see it invested in weatherization and efficiency to benefit and lower costs of energy for customers over the long term than to do a short term solution. And again, imagine the challenge now. CV, this is now 11, 12 years later. They don't even have the same number of customers. A lot of commercial customers they had back then don't exist anymore. There's brand new people. People moved out of state. People moved in state. So the idea that there's this, you know, certain group and they need to get a check is kind of weird because it's not really true. They've, it's changed a lot. So strategic investment, I think, makes a lot more sense for Vermont. Yes. Um, speaking of investors, uh, 
Green Mountain Power is owned by Gaz Metro, at least in the majority, uh, which is owned 100% by a company called Novaco, which is in, uh, owned, again, by a company called Enbridge. Um, and Enbridge is working really hard to make sure that uh, Vermont's energy is going to come from the dirtiest oil in the world, uh, tar sands oil from Alberta, Canada. They're trying to reverse a pipeline that currently goes through the Northeast Kingdom uh, to start carrying uh, tar sands oil from Alberta. Um, it's been called the end of the environmental movement as we know it, um, if tar sands becomes like a facet of uh, the United States' energy. Um, and so we were just wondering what your position is on this pipeline, on Enbridge's uh, significant shareholder stake in Gaz Metro, and then when you merge, they're going to have a significant stake in the, like, 70% of the energy in Vermont, um, and how you think that dealing with another out-of-state corporation is going to help Vermonters in general. Good question. So if everybody didn't catch that, it was really about going beyond Gaz Metro as our investor, but looking at who are the investors in Gaz Metro, and how do I feel about uh, the fact that one of them, Enbridge, which is in fact one of many investors, um, not a controlling stake of Gaz Metro, has some involvement, not the infrastructure fund, which is actually where they're involved with Gaz Metro, but another part of the organization has some involvement. So I think you're right. I think that's a big issue from an environmental perspective and one that is obviously of a lot of uh, you know, heated debate right now. Um, as it relates to us and what we're doing, um, you know, uh, some of the facts you have are, are, are slightly incorrect. Um, Enbridge is, is one of many. They're not a majority. They have actually very small representation overall of the Gas Metro uh, Board of Directors. They don't have a controlling stake of the company, nor will they have a controlling stake in our company or in our future or in any of the decisions uh, that we make on behalf of Vermonters. You know, and further, you know, that's always an interesting challenge because I think if you looked now at the, you know, millions of people who invest in Central Vermont Public Service, for instance, and the different funds and what they're involved in, you're always going to find a variety of interests and things that people invest in. Um, you know, whether it's Green Mountain Coffee Roasters you could look at, you could look at any publicly held company, you're going to find those same kinds of conflicts and alliances. And, um, you know, I think as it relates to Vermont, the important thing is they don't have a controlling stake. They have no controlling stake in Gas Metro, and they have no controlling stake in Vermont or Vermont's energy future. So I, you know, I, I feel very comfortable that what I lay out is is what's important for Vermonters to be talking about and considering, and, and folks can get involved in the, the other debate as they see fit. Next. Yep. Um, I've really admired your leadership in solar. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're setting a, a, an ambitious goal, and more than meeting that um, was impressive. Your, your leadership in, in setting up uh, the solar tariff created an opportunity for the rest of the utilities in the state uh, to follow. Um, I, and I think that um, uh, where solar has gone and, and, and where, where there's been a lot of focus recently is in larger projects. And I think another opportunity that, that Vermont has is a pretty unique feature that we have in group net metering, where there are small systems, a, a group of neighbors can get together uh, and cooperatively own a system uh, and produce their, their own energy and it, 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 uh, it, it provides more opportunity for, for locating very small but very distributed generation that can benefit the grid and, and benefit many more people. I, I have a group net metered system. Um, I, I wonder if you ha have, have captured that as, as being a particular opportunity uh, for elsewhere around the state with this group you know, group system small, four to, you know, my system's 13 kilowatts, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 10 to 50 kilowatts is, is relatively small system that could benefit a fairly large neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you, you, you recognize that as a potential opportunity. Right, so if everybody didn't hear, do I see group net metering as, as, a, as a potential opportunity in the future? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's another area where we've seen the uh, uh, acceleration of that. Uh, you know, I remember when folks in, even in our company, were talking about it as if, oh, it'll never amount to much, you know, and now folks are seeing that it does. The challenge that, 
you know, that uh, utilities have and will always have is the role and the responsibility of, of uh, you know, how do we handle this from a system perspective as more stuff comes online. But I feel that we have really good, competent staff, and I think if folks are appropriately focused on it, we can, we can solve the problems as they come up. But yeah, I definitely see it as, as accelerating in the future. Two or three more. Okay. And then if you want to sit around and ask questions. Oh, thank you. Sure. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Behind and then you. Yeah. Oh, me first? Yes. Okay. Um, I've been uh, a professional, been in it for uh, many years, and talking to other professionals, one of the key obstacles is the financing. And uh, we have the PACE program, the company, um, <laughs> energy districts, where um, that's good, but I know there's a lot of towns that are not going to adopt it. And um, I brought up the net media, our, our on bill financing, and you mentioned on one of your previous slides, and, and it seems like the most eloquent solution. But when I talk to DPS or Efficiency Vermont and BD, they're like, that's the third rail. It's like, we can't touch that. You know, and I see that as such an easy way to be able to provide financing for not just electrical, but mm -hmm. non electrical, all fuels um, financing. And I was wondering if you could comment on. You know, uh, GMP's thoughts on including that as you know, just an extra line item on the bill to make those payments. Right. So the question was about on bill financing. Great question. I couldn't agree with you more that that's one of the obstacles. I think it's great because what we're starting to see are some market solutions like Sun Common, you know, where there's a market solution to helping people at a, at a residential level or commercial level who want to do a project finance it. We are talking about on wheel financing. In fact, I know Liz Miller's coming and she's really the person uh, to, to talk more about it because uh, it really would require regulatory change, particularly to do on bill financing that would be something other than electricity related. You know, as a utility, there's real firewalls between uh, what we can, uh, you know, we have to really be focused on the electric side of the equation. So in her energy plan, I know that she does talk about exploring on-bill financing. We've had many strategic conversations in the state that I've been uh, lucky enough to be a part of to talk about how we get there. We've been talking about and entertaining the idea of a pilot, you know, even as a part of maybe the Rutland experience, you know, to prove out the concept, work out the kinks. Um, but it's 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 definitely on the on the agenda and it's uh, being discussed. I can't say for sure when I think something will or won't happen, but I sure am encouraged by all the discussion about it. Yes, and you had a question. Sorry. Yeah. What will it look like uh, as you scale up the solar and the um, and the wind power in terms of scope? Like, would there be millions of panels needed and hundreds of big towers, and then how will you store that? Right through when it's dark or when it's not good. Great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So the question was, how much do I see hundreds of large wind towers and how many panels? And um, first of all, I'm not all knowing, and I don't know what that flywheel will ultimately lead us to. I think it'll lead us to some really cool solutions. But I don't see, you know, for one, I mean, part of what's been challenging for me about the whole wind debate is there aren't actually that many good spots for industrial wind in Vermont. There just aren't. So I think the idea that we're going to have, you know, tons of projects um, is not a fear people should have because there isn't the transmission in the right places, there isn't the right wind resources along with the right kind of topography. So in terms of industrial wind, I don't see a lot more, to tell you the truth, just because I don't believe there's a lot more tremendous places for it to occur. I do see a lot more community scale and residential scale energy solutions, and I think that's where we're going to see a lot more of the rapid deployment. Um, you know, uh, in terms of how we handle that from a system, that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. You know, if it ramps up quickly, if it ramps up at this pace, you know, making sure that the system is robust so that it can integrate the renewables on the grid. It can be done. I mean, and that's a huge part of what I'm excited about with the Sandia and the UVM partnership is that's a big part of what we want to study on a microgrid basis is how do you really integrate in the most effective way from a transmission and, and distribution system planning perspective. So 
Um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more solar. Um, I don't think we're going to see, a, you know, I think we're going to see more wind, but probably not uh, as much as people would think, given our topography and our, in our system. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more community scale projects. So I think we're just going to take a couple more questions, and then Mary would probably stick around. We have the questions in the back if anybody just wants to continue the conversation, but just one or two more. Stop. Sure. Yes. Mary, um, you spoke of the smart <laughs> use of um, renewables and or natural resources, and I noticed in the slide about the outlook or phase one or the end of phase one that you're biomass has actually decreased um, from 4.2 to 3.1 or something like that. Um, being stewards of our natural resources and being smart, can we use more? Yeah, great question. On the biomass, I think it's more just because the overall portfolio has grown. It's the same. Our biomass that we get is, the, is our ownership share of the McNeil plant. So that hasn't changed. So we haven't deliberately ramped down uh, any dependence on biomass. One of the challenges that we've had uh, in that arena, we've looked at a lot of really interesting projects, and I think there is definitely a space uh, for biomass. It goes back to this gentleman's, I think the, one of my maybe the first question, which was around cost. What we've really seen is uh, you know, we have not been able to yet find that path that gets it to the right kind of cost equation uh, for what we can do. And part of it is because unlike other renewables, right, or some others, um, like wind and the sun and the water, um, biomass is a fuel source that you're purchasing. And it's really hard. The prices can be quite volatile. So it's also really hard, unlike the other equation, where once you've paid off the infrastructure, y y the, the resource itself isn't costing you anything. That's not true with biomass. So that's one of the challenges we've had. We do continue to look at a lot of interesting projects, and we are interested in it. We just have not been able to find that the right fit from a cost perspective that we feel can work uh, for our customers. Last question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Hydro Quebec, uh, and I know that there's new transmission lines that are going the Champlain Hudson transmission line, and then there's transmission lines going through New Hampshire. Uh, and some people are worried about the uh, controlling stake or the possibility of a controlling stake in Velco um, that Green Mountain Power might uh, seek to use Vermont's grid uh, mm -hmm. to move energy down to the New York markets or over to Boston. Um, and it sounds like right now the, the owners really aren't doing much in terms of uh, pushing Green Mountain Power to do anything, but um, I'm wondering if Gas Metro was sold to another investor which had an interest in saying, all right, let's really try to get Vermont to funnel some energy through. Um, how, like, how, how would you respond to that, or how could Green Mountain Power um, try to work against that? Great question. So it's about really control of Velco and the transmission grid and the concern that there could be, uh, you know, in the future, either, I've heard a plot now, some people worry about it, and others worry about in the future what could happen. That is precisely why we have, uh, we right out of the gate, agreed to reduce our ownership of Velco. So the combined company actually would have less than, we'd have about, I think it's 30 some odd percent of Velco, so we wouldn't have controlling share of Velco. That's kind of point number one. Point number two is any project like that, what a lot of people don't understand is not only would you have to go through the FERC, the federal uh, folks to do a project, an economic transmission project like that, you'd have to go through ISO New England, you'd have to go through the Vermont regulatory process, and you'd need a presidential permit. So it's not something that candidly is easy to do, you know what I mean? It's, so even if, let's just say we didn't give up our controlling share in the combined company and there was all that, you know, you're talking about a proposal and a project that would, you know, be years and years and lots of, lots of uh, opportunity for public input and say, et cetera. So, um, but we, 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 we won't have a controlling stake in Velcro, so we, we couldn't influence that even if we wanted to and we don't want to. So. Thank you all.
for joining us in the conversation. Remember, if you come next week, we're going to be in Old Mill. John Dewey, David Blitterstorff, the founder of uh, all of NRG and now all our, and Beth Sachs, as Mary said, the founder of Efficiency Vermont, or PEIC. Anyway, thank you all for participating in the conversation. Thank you for the Center for Research on Vermont for putting the seminar series together. And thank you, Mary Powell, for coming to be part of our conversation. Thank you.